All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our Sunday School class on the Chronicles of Narnia. If you were with us last week, you may recall I didn't quite finish my lesson last time. I still had a couple points that I wanted to cover with y'all. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to teach for like the first 10 or so minutes of the lesson today just to wrap up those points. And then I'm going to hand the floor over to ruling elder Morgan Murphy, who's going to tell us about the relationship between the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and planet Jupiter. We are now in the third lesson for our class on the Chronicles of Narnia. So we set it up with our introductory lesson a couple weeks ago, and then last week we started on The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And so our plan for the class is to spend two weeks on each book within the Chronicles of Narnia going in publication order, not the usual uh, chronological order that you find in most um, volumes of the Chronicles today, but in the original publication order, which every C.S. Lewis expert agrees is the way to go. So we're starting with Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. We're talking about planet Jupiter this week. And then next week, uh, I will resume with Prince Caspian. So uh, you may recall from last week that I identified a few key themes from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Magic, atonement, trilemma, and joy. Last week, I, I was able to get through magic and atonement. If you weren't here for last week's lesson, don't worry. We are recording each of these lessons, and I'm uploading them to my YouTube channel. So you can actually watch the video recording uh, from the lesson. So I'm combining my slides with the audio recording and uploading those to YouTube. So that's available to you if you need to get caught up. But today, I want to wrap it up with points three and four, trilemma and joy. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say the trilemma? Who knows what C.S. Lewis's trilemma is? Any thoughts? Is this familiar to anyone? It's actually a, a pretty common argument used in Christian apologetics. It's related to the identity of Jesus. And so let me bring you to a scene in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You may recall, who was the first child to go into Narnia? Lucy. Now, when she returned, you know, she met Mr. Tumnus, the fawn, and then she returned back through the wardrobe and met her siblings. Did they believe her? No, they did not. The second time Lucy goes into the wardrobe, who follows her? Edmund. So Lucy goes off to meet Mr. Tumnus, and Edmund goes off to meet who? The White Witch, right? Uh, who gives him Turkish delight and then says, if you bring your siblings back to me the next time I see you, I'm going to make you a prince and future king of Narnia after I'm gone. And she's lying, of course. Uh, but uh, Esmond is fooled, and so he returns through the wardrobe again with Lucy, and then they meet their older siblings, Peter and Susan, and Lucy says, hey guys, guess what? We've been to Narnia, and this time Edmund went with me. And what does Edmund say? Lucy's just playing a joke. We're just playing a game. There's no Narnia. Of course, Lucy's devastated, crushed by the fact that, you know, Edmund lied about this. And Peter and Susan are very confused. So who do they go talk to? They go talk to the professor to figure out what, what should, how do they make sense of this. Because it's absurd that a place like Narnia would exist, and yet normally they trust their sister Lucy. And so what does the professor say to them? He says these words. Logic, said the professor, half to himself. Why don't they teach logic at these schools? There are only three possibilities. Either your sister is telling lies, or she is mad, or she is telling the truth. You know she doesn't tell lies, and it is obvious that she is not mad. For the moment, then, and unless any further evidence turns up, we must assume that she is telling the truth. So you see how Peter and Susan only have three possibilities? Their sister Lucy's claiming they've been to Narnia. Of course, Edmund denies it, but they have to know who to trust. And there's really, logically speaking, only three possibilities. Either Lucy's lying, or she's mad, or she's telling the truth. That's a trilemma. Why did Lewis include this? in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Why does this dialogue exist? Why does it occur? Yes, Lewis makes the same point regarding Jesus in his book, Mere Christianity. This is an apologetic argument. It's, it's an argument in defense of the reasonableness of the Christian faith and the truthfulness of the historical Jesus. Here's the quote from Mere Christianity, where Lewis is making the same argument, which is famously known as his trilemma. Lewis says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. How common is it to hear skeptics make that claim about Jesus? No, I don't think he rose from the dead. I don't think he's the son of God, but he's a good man. He's a wise teacher. Lewis is saying that position makes no sense. That is the one thing we must not say. 
A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, this trilemma argument is sometimes known, more commonly, as liar, lunatic, or lord. And I have some pop culture references here for you. Let's see how well you know your movies. What's the picture from for Liar? Do you guys know the scene? Liar! Liar! It's the wife of Miracle Max. What's her, is it Valerie? Is that her name? Billy Crystal, right? He's Miracle Max. Okay, so you know the scene, right? She's accusing her husband of being a liar because um, he's, what, it's something about Prince Humperdinck, I don't remember. True love, is that it? Yeah, that's it. The next one might be a little bit more obscure to you. 12 Monkeys. Yes, it's a, it's a bizarre dystopian sci-fi movie from the 90s starring Bruce Willis. It involves time travel. It was directed by Terry Gilliam. Does anybody know Terry Gilliam? Monty Python? Yeah, so pretty strange. Uh, a sci-fi movie directed by one of the Monty Python cast. Um, it was also one of Brad Pitt's breakout roles. Um, you know, this was like when his career was kind of just taking off. He's a very bizarre character in that movie. If you've ever seen the movie, you know, uh, my opinion, the movie was good. It was turned into a, a, a TV show for the Sci-Fi Channel, which was great. Like, and maybe that's just because I'm kind of a sci-fi geek myself, but I loved the show. Anyway, Brad Pitt does a good job of portraying a lunatic, okay? And then, of course, I think everybody knows Lord here, right? The Lord of the Rings, you know, Aragorn, okay? So, those are your options. You can either call Jesus a liar, or you can call him a lunatic, or you can call him Lord. What do you guys think of this argument? Pretty good. Yes, provided you accept the veracity of Scripture, which is precisely what skeptics don't do. How do you think most skeptics today would try to find their way out of this trilemma? They would opt for a fourth option. Now I'm testing your pop culture trivia knowledge here. What movie would that be? Tom Cruise, this was one of his earliest roles. This was like pre-Top Gun. Yes, that's right, Legend. The movie itself was called Legend. So it's this fantasy movie from the early 80s, kind of weird. But um, the fourth option that many skeptics today would take would be to say that Jesus never claimed that about himself. His disciples later came up with those claims and attributed it to him because of their devotion to him or whatever. That one's a little bit more of a challenge because this is the, the, the argument you're going to hear today. How might you respond to that fourth option then, as a Christian? This, this puts us kind of in an awkward, frustrating position, because every evidence we put forward, they're going to say, yeah, it didn't happen. Exactly. In fact, let me elaborate on that point. There are a couple ways that we could respond to this objection, the legend objection. First of all, read the Gospels. Do they sound like legend to you? Yes, there's a lot of miraculous supernatural elements in them, how many of you actually went and saw the uh, further up and further in performance with Max McLean uh, at the Orpheum? Uh, you recall, for those of you who went, you recall he actually mentions the trilemma in that performance, and he actually mentions the legend argument as well. And um, this is C.S. Lewis himself anticipated that objection, and he said, "You know what my expertise is? Like Lewis himself, what his expertise is? He was an expert in literature, folklore." You know, so medieval and Renaissance European literature was his specialty. He knows what legends look like. And he says the Gospels are not that. They have a, a very different style. They're more down to earth. Um, they don't answer the questions that legends explore, like, you know, the childhood of Jesus, for example. We have later uh, apocryphal Gospels that do, like, come up with fanciful tales of the, the miracles during Jesus' childhood, like turning, like, mud pies into pigeons and weird things like that. Those are legends. But what we see in the Gospels are very different. The style just doesn't match the genre of legend. But there is another strategy that we could use um, to respond to the legend objection. And that is simply, apply the trilemma to the disciples. Okay, we have the testimony of the disciples themselves. We have the testimony of the Apostle Paul, John, Matthew, so forth. 
Either they are lying in their testimony and, and they know Jesus never did those things or claimed those things, or they are all deluded, they're all insane, they're all suffering from some mass hysteria, mass hallucination, or they're telling the truth. What's the most plausible option? We can still use the trilemma, just apply it to the disciples. And I think we can still vindicate the truth claims of Jesus as recorded in the New Testament. So that is one key theme that I think is worth um, acknowledging from the line, the witch in the wardrobe. The final point, and then I'll hand it over to Morgan, has to do with the general theme of joy, which I think will set it up well for our discussion on the joviality of the line, the witch in the wardrobe, its connection to Jupiter. How do we see joy expressed in the line, the witch in the wardrobe? I think that there's two key ways that we see it expressed throughout this book. The theme of spring, of course, you know, with the arrival of Aslan in Narnia, you know, it brings an end to winter. And it's said that during the reign of the White Witch, and she reigns for what, like a century almost? During that time, it's always winter and never Christmas. And so Lewis is trying to make a point. He's trying to get us to consider, look at the weather outside right now. How many of you would be okay with it if it stayed this way forever? I don't think I'd be too thrilled with that, right? Or how about, you know, when we had the snow like a couple weeks ago? You know, snow is nice for a couple days. Then it starts to get old, right? Uh, and so think about, like, how would you feel living in that sort of environment forever? That's what the witch represents, right? She is against joy. She is against life. Um, and so here is what uh, Joe Rigney has to say about this theme. Uh, within his book, Live Like a Narnian. The witch's evil is not fundamentally about winter and cold weather, but about a deep-seated hostility to life, joy, and celebration. One of the times when we see the witch really lose her temper, I mean, it happens a lot in the book, but one of the times she really loses her temper is when she comes across the party of the woodland creatures after they have just feasted with who? Father Christmas. So Father Christmas has departed, and then you have these woodland creatures like squirrels and a fox and so forth, and, and how does the witch respond? What's the meaning of this indulgency, this, this waste, this gluttony, right? She's furious because of what the end of winter represents. It represents life. It represents joy. Lewis is trying to get us to appreciate the gift that God has given us with the changing of the seasons. Like, that, that, that winter season is, is appropriate in its place, um, but it, it, it's valuable because it's temporary because it promises something beyond it. It promises the arrival of spring. And that's what Lewis wants us to, to embrace and live out in our own lives. The next point has to do with food. Have you noticed, like, throughout the Chronicles, but especially in this one, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, how much detail Lewis gives to describing feasting and food? I mean, he mentions everything on the table. And it's in very vivid detail that he describes all of the, all of the meals so think, like the first meal described, I think, is when Mr. Tumnus, you know, provides a meal for Lucy. But then also think about when Aslan encounters the children. The first thing he does after he meets them is he throws a feast for them. And then right after the final battle against the White Witch, what's the first thing they do? They have high tea time. And then what happens the evening of the coronation of the Pevensey children? It's a glorious feast, and each of these meals is described vividly. What's the significance of the food? Again, it's about joy. It's not about gluttony, right? It's not about waste. It's not about self-indulgence like the white witch thinks. The witch and her evil are the origins of both gluttony and asceticism, of sinful indulgence and sinful austerity. See, the witch, in, in her own way, represents the extremes. What's the first meal that the witch offers? Turkish delight. And how does Edmund respond to that Turkish delight? He wants more, right? He, just, he wolfs it down until he feels sick right? That's gluttony. That's what the witch represents. It's, 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 a, it's a failure to properly submit our appetites to our highest loyalty, right? There is a proper place for feasting. There is a proper place for cele celebration, but it's like it, it should be understood as the golden mean between gluttony and, and asceticism or sinful austerity. This is what scripture tells us, that we can enjoy the good gifts that God has created us, but the key to enjoying them is to honor them as God has designed them. And so here's how Rigney concludes this chapter, and then I'll hand it over to Morgan. The glorious truth is that Lewis's vision of feasting through winter and glorying in spring and resisting the seductive dullness of the witch's world is not just a fairy tale, 
but the way the world really is. In the bleak midwinter long ago, spring landed in Bethlehem and began to unthaw the world. Frozen rivers melted and stone statues began to come to life. The Son of Man came eating and drinking and magically turned water into wine and multiplying loaves and fishes on a grassy hillside. Accused of gluttony and indulgence, he endured the scorn and violence of men with ice in their veins. Dying for those who feasted on the witch's food, he broke his own stone table and is now casting out the wicked and arrogant so that the meek can inherit the earth and sit on thrones at a great wedding supper because Jesus, like Aslan, is Lord of the feast. All right, Morgan, you're up. <clears throat> Thanks, Kyle. It's a joy to have this gifted teacher uh, teaching us week in and week out. Um, he puts a lot of time into it, and we're really grateful. Thank you, Kyle. And I'm really grateful to get to follow him <clears throat> because that's awesome. Um, <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's like the Rolling Stones opening for, I don't know, Flock of Seagulls or something. <laughs> but, um, all right. So what we're going to have to... Pull some of this out, I think um, we're just a little bit behind. I wanted to talk about transfer classicism, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. I really want to talk about magic, mm, but this is, this is a little bit of a hobby horse of mine, and maybe I should just save most of it for at some other point. But um, I, let me just say this. How do I? Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we have to understand about magic and C.S. Lewis's program. This is, really what, this is really what I want to get to, is what is C.S. Lewis doing? And I think we, are, we will benefit from understanding C.S. Lewis more as we read C.S. Lewis more and more. And this is the reason I wanted to get into magic a little bit, because I think as, as moderns, part of our problem with not understanding magic is that we have embraced scientism too much. And so what, what we, lots of words on that, but let me just jump to the end. We have to, we, we believe as Christians that God upholds all things by the word of his power. The only reason I am able to stand here and communicate with you right now is because God is empowering me to do that. And the only reason you're able to hear me is because God is giving us the power. And so we have, in modern days, separated the natural from the supernatural in an unbiblical way. There is no separation of natural and supernatural. God is the power. The supernatural is always animating the natural. Always. Always, always, always. And so when we think, well, magic, magic can't be true because, well, you know, we understand how babies are made and it's not magic anymore. Well, no, God still is working through those things by the word of his power. It's all God's power. And so, yes, there are unique or extraordinary powers that God can level at times. We call that miracle, or we see them variously in the scriptures. Sometimes we even call it gifting. If you have the gifts of the Spirit that I can, that someone can heal or interpret tongues or teach. We call them, those are unique gifts of God, unique powers that God has given, yet God is the giver of the powers. The issue is authority. By what authority are you doing this magic? Christians, we should believe in magic. The world is magical, and I, and I think it's one of C.S. Lewis's points to us is he is attempting to re-enchant a disenchanted world. He wants to show you through story, no, 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 this world is enchanted, and we need to hear him, we need to hear him say that. This is a great quote. We'll get to this later, but Don Treader, uh, Eustace is talking to this guy who's a, who's a star. Uh, if you haven't read it, it doesn't make sense, but just trust me. And he says, Eustace says, well, in our world, says Eustace, the star is a huge ball of flaming gas. And then Ramandu, the star says, even in your world, my son, that is not what a star is, but only what it is made of. And so C.S. Lewis is saying, even in your world, friends, your world, that's not what a star is. And C.S. Lewis believed that. He believed that stars were something else. Uh, we, we could talk about that at length, but C.S. Lewis is trying to tell us, no, 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 the world is magic. Satyrs and all of these magical creatures, the trees that, be careful, this, these are wicked trees, we have to be quiet when, we, when we're whispering back and forth. The world is magical, and we need to, he we need to hear that. Um, uh, this is a hobby horse of mine. 
This is the picture of Moses working magic, tapping the rock, and water comes out of it. I'll just give this quickly. There's two times when Moses does this. Moses, one time in Exodus 17, God says, take the staff, tap the rock, and water is going to come out of it. Now, we either understand that in one of two ways. Either God is standing behind Moses, and Moses is just sort of play-acting, and when he taps the rock, God then uses power to bring water from the rock. That's, I think that's the way commonly we would, maybe the way I believed it. God is the one who's working the power. But, but we have a problem here because God says to Moses, you tap the rock. And I want all these people to see you do this thing. And so it could potentially be this little, is this a deception? Is God attempting to show Moses doing something and then sleight of hand, something comes forth? What's really going on here? Why not? Have Moses say, call, pray to God to bring water from the rock, and then I will do that. If that's what's actually happening, he could have, God could have made that happen, but he didn't. He said, Moses, do this thing. And I'm contending to you that God gave Moses unique powers, and Moses was the one who had the power. Moses was the one who had the power, and I can prove it. Because in Numbers 20, God says, speak to the rock. Speak to the rock and water will come forth. And here's what happens. Moses says, Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock and said to them, here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock. God said, speak to the rock. Moses struck the rock. Moses disobeyed God's word. Moses sinned and will be judged for this sin. God says, because you did not obey my word, you do not get to enter the promised land because of this sin. But what happened? It worked. It worked. Water came out of the rock. And so now we have a challenge. Do we say, all right, Moses sinned. He should have spoken to the rock, but he hit the rock. Well, God went, okay, well, that's not what I said to do, but I, I'm going to go ahead and bring, the, bring water forth anyway. Or we say, no, 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 God invested this human with unique power. And he used his, as we know, with great power comes, you're all thinking it, with great power comes great responsibility, and he, possessing this unique power from God, used it sinfully and was therefore judged by it. And so my, my position is this world is magical, we see it in the scripture, C.S. Lewis is trying to tell you that, and I'll even make the edgy claim, Moses was a wizard. But, uh, and who is this guy? What's his name? I forgot. John Heston, of course. John Heston. Notice how they all have robes, and there's something about the staff. I think there's something biblical there where we, we call it a wand or a staff or whatever. But lots of uh, pop culture references today. All right. So anyway, that's a little bit of a hot horse of mine. But the world is, the world is magical. C.S. Lewis is trying to teach us that. And I, and I think... We, uh, we're helped by understanding, the more we under, understand Lewis, the more we're able to understand Lewis. This has been my experience. Um, I, I heard it, I, I was, we were reading um, Inferno, um, and, I, and we, we read it in reference to Dante, and one of the statements was, once you read Inferno, you're now ready to read the Inferno. And I, and I think the same thing could be applied to C.S. Lewis. Once you read C.S. Lewis, now you're ready to start reading C.S. Lewis. And that's, that's been my experience. And one of the things that I, I, I hearken back to one of the, this um, quote from The Weight of Glory, which C.S. Lewis is applying um, his study of Greek. And he says, uh, the schoolboy begins Greek grammar, cannot look forward to his adult enjoyment of so Sophocles as a lover looks forward to marriage or a general to victory. The student has to begin by working for Marx or to escape punishment, or to please his parents, or at best, in the hope of a future good which he cannot at present imagine or desire. The reward he is going to get will, in actual fact, be a natural or proper reward, but he will not know it until he's got it. And I, I think the same thing could be applied about C.S. Lewis. You have to kind of work your way through and understand his program and understand what he's, what he's trying to do. And then once you get there, you're able to understand what he's doing and see it and benefit from it. And here we are still talking about C.S. Lewis 70 years later. We're going to be talking about him in 70 years to come. It is worthwhile for us to, 
to work at it and understand what he's trying to do. What's his view? How's he trying to communicate to us? What, what specifically is he saying? So all of that to say we come to, to Line the Witch in the Wardrobe and Michael Ward's book on planet Narnia. And his position is what Kyle has said is that each of these books, um, let, let me just read this. Uh, Ward's, Ward's emphasis was to track each of the seven planets as it appears throughout the course of Lewis's writing, to analyze the deployment of relevant planets' imagery on the Chronicle, and then to assess the theological messages embodied and expressed by that deployment. His, his position is that C.S. Lewis was actually trying to speak to each planet in each one of the, uh, each one of the books of the Narniad. And so the whole book is trying to make that point. Now, Kyle and I discussed this. I, I don't know how many of you are really that interested in medieval cosmology. You know, I, I, I had to learn it and say, okay, now I can kind of see. So I think there's some value in understanding his position because I think there's value in understanding what Lewis is doing. What's his program? Because you can take this, not only apply it to Narnia, but apply it to all his writings. So from my experience, I read That Hideous Strength, which love, maybe my favorite C.S. Lewis book. No, I don't know. I love it. Let me just say that. Um, and I read that book. I read Ward's book, and I went back and read That Hideous Strength again, and it, boom, it opened all of this up to me. So I think understanding his program is worthwhile. Um, all right. So for the program here, what, what his position is, is that Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is an attempt to incarnate Jupiter or Jove or Zeus. And um, man, uh, there's so much to say about who, who Jupiter and, and Zeus is. But li- this, this, I think, is valuable because this was his, po- his poem, The Planets. And I think it was reading this that made this, some of this, this kappa element come together for Ward. And so as he's seeing these things, he's reading about Lewis talk about Jove, and he's thinking, man, that sounds a lot like the chronic, uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So on Jove, this is a long planet or a long poem, and it goes through each of the planets, but on Jove, he says, joy and jubilee, it is Jove's orbit, of wrath ended and woes mended, of winter past and guilt forgiven, and good fortune, Jove is master, and of jocund revel, laughter of ladies, the lion-hearted, on his wide forehead, calm and kingly, no care darkens, nor wrath wrinkles, but righteous power and leisure and largesse, their loose splendors have wrapped around him, a rich mantle of ease and empire. So that, that's Lewis envisioning what, uh, in poetry, what Jove or Jupiter, the elements that would matter. And so we'll, we're going to see each one of these elements. We're going to talk about how those elements appear in, um, in Narnia. So this is interesting. Last week, we were at the very end of our worship. We sing a little refrain. And you may not remember, but the refrain is from, Oh God, beyond all praising. You with me? And I... I love that song, and I was thinking, that, that's from Holst, The Planets. That tune is The Planets. And I wondered, is, is this Jupiter? Is this song that we sing, is this Jupiter? And Kyle? Oh God, beyond all praising. What I wish is John Hodges could come and talk to us about this song, because this is Jupiter. This tune that we sing, Oh God, beyond all praising, is Holst, writing in symphony, the planets. And um, let me see here. I've got a quote about it. Yeah. Uh, the image that he thus disposes are analogous to the musical notes that Holst arranged in the fourth item of his planet suite, Jupiter, the bringer of jollity. Lewis greatly admired Holst's orchestral interpretation of the planetary characters in the suite presumably played a part in the various sources of inspiration which led him to write the Chronicles. This song led to the Chronicles. It's pretty good. So 
I wish we could, if you, uh, all right, anyway, that's pretty good. All right, so what are we talking about? Job, Jupiter, what, what are we really saying? I'm sorry about the, the clunky or the, the packed slide, but let me just read this to you. Of the seven medieval planets, only one is named by Lewis in the Narniad, Jupiter, the planet of kingship, which as Millward has noted, is evidently his favorite. This is Lewis's favorite planet. Jupiter has a long pedigree in Lewis's works. It shows strongly in his scholarship and poetry, makes a central contribution to the Ransom Trilogy, and most important, as I will argue, animates the imaginative vision of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So this is the point. I will contend that this first chronicle was deliberately designed to communicate the jovial spirit. The main events of the plot, numerous points of ornamental detail, and the manner of portrayal of Aslan conspire to express this jovial kappa element. Does, do you remember what that kappa element is? Kyle taught on this before. What, is, what's that, what does he mean by kappa element? Hidden, yeah, which is an interesting way to do it. So he hid, he hid his meaning by using the word kappa. It means hidden. So this hidden element is uh, what he's going at. So what do we mean jovial? What is that? It's... What does jovial mean? The character he produces, this is jovial. The character he produces in men would now be very imperfectly expressed by the word jovial and is not very easy to grasp. We may say it is kingly, but I love this. We must think of it as a king at peace, enthroned, taking his leisure, serene. The jovial character is cheerful, festive, yet temperate, tranquil, magnanimous. When this planet dominates, we may expect halcyon days and prosperity. In Dante, wise and just princesses go to this sphere when they die. He is the best planet, and it is called the greater fortune, Fortuna Major. So think of Lord of the Rings. Think of Aragorn after he defeats um, Sauron, and he's the king at peace on his throne. Christmas present, jovial. That's exactly right. That's, that's a good picture of who it is. I was going to put a picture of him in there, but I didn't. But yes, exactly right. So Jupiter in the lion specifically, this is the book. In the first chronicle, he goes inside Jove, as it were, and writes from within specifically jovial imagery so that joviality is turned into a story. Most significantly, Aslan focuses and condenses, we might almost say, incarnates the preside, that presiding spirit. So that's, that's the position that Ward is making. And I think, I, I believe it. I think it's good. So here are the four things that we're going to get to, or try to at least. So this was from the poem of Winter Past. We're going to talk about the use of Father Christmas from the poem of Wrath Ended and Woes Mended. And then lastly, He's the King. So of Winter Past. Now, Kyle's already mentioned a lot of this, but this is just um, the, one of the, the main themes of the book is as uh, always Christmas, always winter, never Christmas, always winter, never Christmas, always winter, never Christmas. And then as Aslan appears, it begins to thaw. So Ward says, in the lion, the um, estival, which means the summer, the summer influence of the jovial Christ accounts for this key architectonic feature of the story the overthrow of the white witch's reign. And so um, I, I think that's, that's clear. We've, Kyle's already talked about that a little bit, but l just for our own enjoyment and pleasure in the story. What other elements is C.S. Lewis communicating to us as we see, what, what are you thinking about as you see it begin to thaw in Narnia? What Okay, renewal, that's great. What else? Hope, spring's coming. Okay, what else? Rebirth, question. Does it start to turn spring after Aslan dies on the stone table? No. When does it start? Who's, whose world is it? Who's, whose world is Narnia? Amateur okay. beyond the sea, right? And, and as Aslan returns to it, She's been there, she's had her reign, but as he comes, just his presence brings spring. And I, I, this makes me think of, oh, you know, Abraham Kuyper's. What's Abraham Kuyper's most famous quote? Who knows it? Yes, what is it? Get the, every square inch, what's the whole thing? 
All right, so there's not one, I, I had to look it up today, there's not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Oh, I love that. And isn't that true? That is Aslan, mine, mine, always, always mine. And um, just him arriving, and I think the application here for me is, man, it feels it, it can often feel like the white witch is reigning in your life. And believe, believer, no, there is not one square inch today where Jesus doesn't point his finger and say, mine, politics, crazy life, social, blah, 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 whatever is happening today, Jesus Christ says, mine, he is, he is the one who owns it all. And maybe the white witch will have her time, but this world belongs to Christ. So... I love it. All right, so winter passed. Father Christmas, what did, what did, all right, my experience, the, I can remember the first time I read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I was surprised to see Father Christmas pop in. I'm like, this is kind of weird. What's he doing there? This, I'm, I'm, I am living in Narnia, and here comes Father Christmas. It dragged me back to, anybody else have that experience? You did. What, what, what did his C.S. Lewis's friend Tolkien think about the use of Father Christmas? Does anybody know? Yeah, um, did not like it. In fact, um, one of Lewis's friends, George Sayer, when discussing Tolkien's reaction to Narnia's Father Christmas, recalled, Lewis was hurt, astonished, and discouraged when Tolkien said that he thought the book was almost worthless that it seemed like a jumble of unrelated mythologies because Aslan, the Fawns, the White Witch, Father Christmas, the Nymphs, and Mr. and Mrs. Beaver had quite distinct mythological or imaginative origins. Tolkien thought that it was a terrible mistake to put them together in Narnia, a single imaginative country. So he's, he took heat for, for this, and probably all the critics are like, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. Everybody kind of agrees. This is a strange inclusion. And maybe even you felt it as you read it. This is pretty strange to have this included in there. But if we begin to embrace the kappa element here, it kind of comes together. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, he, he certainly uses it and he weaves it in. It's just the inclusion of Father Christmas, though, was, was strange. But if you, if you take a step back and, and approach this Kappa element and say, if he's trying to, if he's trying to incarnate Jove, this, this is the inclusion. He, Jove actually shows up. But his, his quote is, but once one has grasped the real and inward significance of the work as a whole, its Kappa element, or this Jupiter, or Jove, one can see why Lewis was so adamant to retain Father Christmas. Father Christmas is, in modern culture, the jovial character par excellence, loud-voiced, red-faced, and jolly. Of the lion's cast, he is the one most unmistakably born under Jupiter. All right, makes sense. Okay, so I'll, I'll go with that. I, I think it's a little bit, oh, I, I put that up there. Yeah, I think it's a little bit, was a little bit strange, but it makes sense thinking, oh, he's trying to, he's trying to do the Jupiter Joe thing. All right. Makes sense. Father Christmas. Of wrath ended and woes mended. Now, Kyle, ugh, this, is, this is the heart of, I think, the heart of the book. I remember my first experience with Narnia was watching the cartoon on TV. Anybody else? Is that, is that where you first got your experience? I, yeah. That's where I first saw it, and I was not a believer, and all I know is that was emotional. Um, that, that had me, and uh, I, Kyle talked at length about atonement, and um, and the themes of atonement, there's just so much there. It's just so beautifully, uh, I keep, keep wanting to use the same word, incarnate. I mean, you're, you are living in the beauty of this atonement. And um, I, I love this quote from his book. Thinking about, thinking about Lewis's use of atonement here in the story. We can never look at the atonement from outside, determining scientifically its means of operation. The relative qualities of human and divine action, the precise calibration of the elements. At some point, we must simply enjoy it as one feature of the divine life. Myers approaches this kind of an opinion when she says, the desire to, 
the desired response to the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe is not to believe in the vicarious suffering of Christ, but to taste it. That's good. It's not, we're not struggling with, all right, how exactly did this work? How, how did he, so he died for Edmund, but that's the old magic, and, and so, you know, how, we, we're just really experiencing it and tasting the, tasting the beauty of that. And, um, man, that, that is such a strong and, and beautiful image. And connected to, as, as Ward's point is, connected to Jupiter, or Jove, of wrath ended and woes mended. So, all right, let me see here. How are we doing? Um, all right, getting close. The, uh, mm, he's the king. Um, maybe the, maybe my favorite section of the book is when they finally are gathered with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. And the question is asked, who is Aslan? Asked Susan. And Mr. Beaver said, why don't you know? He's the king. And um, uh, Ward says, Aslan's kingly power is not self-assertive, but rests on a foundation of submissive acceptance to his father's appointment. He will not work against the emperor's magic, but demonstrate his complete devotion to the dying to achieve Edmund's ransom. Aslan's father, the emperor, named on six occasions, never features in the story in his own person, but nevertheless, is, his presence is felt in the first book more than in any of the others. In fact, he is mentioned more often in this tale than in the rest of the books put together. And so what, what we see as Aslan's kingship is, um, just like the kingship of Christ, is uh, from the emperor. And then his kingship flows down to the kings and queens of Narnia. And so um, not only is this an element of the story, um, and, and again, so the, kind of the atonement, these aren't just or in, the, in, the, in the thawing, the always winter, never Christmas. These aren't just elements of the story. They are the story. And I, I have to, this is my favorite, so I have to read out of this thing. Um, it's moving to me. I love this section. But um, the, the conversation with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver um, says, Aslan is a man? Um, is, he, is he a man, says Lucy? Aslan, a man, said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he's the king of the wood, the son of the great emperor beyond the, beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mr. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about being safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's, but he's good. Ugh, that is so good. And I know some of you, and I know you, you know this about our king, that he's not safe. And I think we want, we, young, when I was young, I, or maybe even now still, I really, really want a safe king. I want him to be safe. I want him to, I want him to, I want to have a, I want Jesus to come into my life and have a great plan for my life. And I want things to be great. I, I want that. But the reality is, he's the king. He is the king. And he's not safe. And you've tasted that. Um, we've tasted that. Uh, the life that we experience in this world, you've, we've tasted it with you. The, the loss, the pain, the diagnoses, the, the, the reality that we serve a God who is not safe, but you've also tasted he's good. And that one can be harder to push through. We're going to see that. We see it dimly, and we're all going to see it perfectly soon. Uh, but it's true. And I, at this point, we just have to hold on and thank C.S. Lewis for giving us this vision 
giving us these words. Uh, he's not safe. He's not safe, friends, but he's good. I love that. Maybe my favorite part of the book. As I said before, these themes don't just animate the story. They comprise the story. This is what uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is all about. And the last thing, and we'll end with this, Donna Gallaty, this was a term that he, he wanted to quote. Be, does anybody remember what Donna Gallaty means? Somebody say it. Yes, the essence, the, 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 the aroma, the atmosphere. The, um, you can think back to maybe nostalgia of your home. Um, he, um, he, he would love to go visit Donegal, and he just had this sense of this place that he loved, and he would return there. And, and so they, they had to coin this term, Donegality. And um, by Donegality, Ward says, we mean to denote the spiritual essence of a work of art as intended by the artist and inhabited unconsciously by the reader. The Donegality of a story is its particular and deliberate atmosphere or quality, its pervasive and purposed integral tone or flavor. And so take all those things that we've just talked about and mix them together, and we, we realize that C.S. Lewis is giving us, a, giving us a taste of atonement. He's giving us a taste of Christ's kingly reign in our lives. He's letting us actually inhabit a world, a supposal world. where What would a world be like that seemed ruled by the white witch, but was actually ruled by the king. And he's letting us live in that truth and letting us have that experience and the flavor of seeing the, seeing the, the snows melt and spring come. And guess what? That is the world that you inhabit. We, you actually inhabit a world that's ruled by the king, not a square inch. And so the flavor, the aroma, the atmosphere of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is the atmosphere of the world that you actually inhabit. And then this, this portion, the reason I put this picture up is because Ward says he actually gives us a scene of Donegal, and um, it's at the very end of, uh, probably close to the end of the book, um, as, they're, as after, after it's all over, they're, gonna, they're working their way back to Care Paravel, and it says, and the next day after that, at about tea time, they actually reached the mouth, the castle of Care Paravel, on its little hill, um, towered up above them. Before them were the sands, the rocks, and little pools of salt water, and seaweed, and the smell of the sea, and long miles of bluish green waves breaking forever and ever on the beach. And oh, the cry of the seagulls. Have you heard it? Can you remember? It's, it's as if C.S. Lewis is, he, he came out of the story for a second, and he's actually inhabiting and looking and seeing and remembering um, this beautiful place. And, and then he says, it's rolling forever and ever. And that takes us to, do you see the city on the hill? Do you see, do you see truth? Can you, can you hear the seagulls? Can you, can you smell the sea air? It's coming for us. Do you, can you smell it? Can you see it? Do you remember? And um, I love that. I love that this is, it's not only taking, he's taking us to that place, but he's arch, you know, He's bringing us forward and helping us see the consummation of all things in the, the city on the hill and the, the river that we will all eventually cross. And the, can you hear it? Can you see it? It's glorious. And so as we transition from Sunday school into worship, this is the king that we're going to, this is a, just a little tiny picture of the king that we're going to move to worship. Um, this, is, this is a picture, tiny picture, of the atonement that he has worked on your behalf. You are Edmund in this story. <laughs> You're not Peter. You're not Lucy. None of us are Lucy. Lucy's the hero. None of us are Lucy. We're Edmund. And he was delighted to lay down on the stone table for you. And so that is, that is a God that's worthy of praise. That is a God beyond all praising. And we will worship him today. Let's pray together. Father, we give you glory. We thank you for this tiny picture. We thank you for the flavor and the taste of your atonement. We pray we would live in it. And oh, Lord God, you are the king, and you are not safe, but you're good. And we cling to that truth. We, we cling to it, and we will fight to believe it, and fight to live in it, and 
we will sing your praises in worship because we believe it to be true. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.